I have Pastor Anson Veenstra with us this week. Hello, Pastor Anson. Hello, Zach. Thanks and for whoever else is listening. That's right. All all thirty or whatever people that check in, uh, but yes. still but still worth it. Um, we met. I think the first time we ever met Anson was on winter retreat. Yes. I think I met you up at Fort Wilderness for the first time. Um, yes. And that was a few years ago already. How long have you been in Classes, Wisconsin? Uh, this is my second time, but it's been three years now um, since we came on in, in 2018. So, um, yeah. And the first time was uh, in way back in 93 when I was ordained and uh, was part of the uh, Classes then. It was a wonderful experience. Loved it. Met some great godly people and uh, enjoyed our ministry at Living Hope. In oh, you were at Living Hope. I, I didn't know that. I learned something new. Yep. Cool. Yep. That was back when I had hair, too. So yeah. ministry has uh, served its purpose in uh, yeah, giving me a nice shine on my head now. That's good. So. Well, that's a sign of uh, respect, right? Was that a proverb? And it's just a sign of old age. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and your history and and where you've pastored and how you how you've uh, come sure. to Sure. So, uh, like I said, graduated from seminary in '93. Uh, did seven years in Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, just you know, uh, moved there with two children. Had two more children while we were there. Um, it was uh, an exciting time, and um, a, a small church, and uh, they got a young pastor and decided that uh, if we get this young pastor we're going to uh, grow and uh, we prove that wrong real quickly uh, but anyway it was they, they say your first ministry does a lot more to form and shape who you are as a pastor and how you pastor than um, than you will do actually to to help out the congregation and uh, that proved to be uh, the case we we really enjoy our time there, still have some good friends uh, from that area, uh, some people that came to the church about the same time that uh, we showed up and uh, just have uh, stayed in touch with them and uh, it's just been uh, a wonderful. And then uh, after seven years, uh, we were kind of feeling the call at that time to, to maybe do some kind of a teen ministry. Um, I've had this ongoing conversation with God for years, Zach, that uh, I don't feel like I'm, uh, um, you know, a, a pastor material. I, I feel more like a, a team player and uh, would be good on staff somewhere. And uh, so we looked at different opportunities and, and uh, an exciting one in Des Moines showed up at uh, the Des Moines Christian Reformed Church at that time. Uh, and uh, we were on staff then with uh, Pastor Alden Kuyper as a uh, pastor of youth and outreach was my job description. And that was that was another wonderful time, you know, just uh, we're able to to work specifically with the youth, we preach uh, occasionally, uh, but put a lot of my focus and energy into trying to build up a youth ministry. Had some great volunteers there; the, the vision was good, and um, enjoyed that. And that went on for about seven years. And th this is a very, you know, kind of a brief summary. Um, we we still have many good friends in that area too. Um, Des Moines at that time, they had relocated from uh, west part of Des Moines proper to west Des Moines, and, uh, and they moved, and they also moved uh, campuses with the Christian school. Uh, they had been uh, meeting for years at uh, First Federated Church building that was really close by, and uh, then they got a campus uh, in Urbandale and uh, relocated. Well... As it goes, the uh, the church kind of uh, were tight on funds, you know. They were building a new school. They built a new church, you know. It's an exciting time to be there and uh, enjoy that time. But then I think uh, funds kind of ran dry on their youth ministry after mm -hmm. six years. And uh, so they said, I think you uh, might want to look elsewhere. And so we had explored different options and... Uh, then a, uh, a very seasoned old pastor from our first time in Classes, Wisconsin, Pastor John Bilesma, 
He gave me a call. He said, Anson, I got a perfect opportunity for you. And uh, he said, it's uh, Baldwin Christian Reformed Church. He was doing an interim there. And we looked at the, uh, at the profile and said, I don't think so. <laughs> but because I respect John so much, uh, we uh, checked it out. And uh, I think all of our uh, family at that time, uh, our, our kids were involved with that process too. Our oldest daughter was going into uh, her sophomore year at, uh, at, in high school. And uh, you know, our youngest was uh, going into third grade. And uh, so we, you know, considered all the option, realizing that, you know, sometimes uh, as you move, you have to just follow God's lead. And it really felt like God was uh, leading us in that direction. And uh, in an amazing sort of way, uh, Baldwin uh, just became like home. We stayed there for 12 years and, and had a lot of work. I said I was doing more youth ministry in Baldwin Right. Uh, than I did as a, as a paid pastor in Des Moines um, and getting paid less for it. So, you know, <laughs> it was uh, kind of uh, exciting times. But, uh, yeah, our youngest son basically just grew up in that area. You know, he uh, went through the school system at Baldwin, and um, our kids all graduated from uh, the, the Baldwin-Woodville High School. So uh, it was an exciting time. And then... We, we sort of felt, you know, not because we were necessarily looking to leave and not because they were showing the door, but we thought, you know, maybe with some of the things that uh, need to happen here at Baldwin, we might consider uh, something else. And so we kind of just roughly, you know, re-upped our profile a little bit and, and got into dialogue with the Racine Church, and it felt like a good fit. And um, so... We moved, and this is uh, Sylvia and myself, our first move as empty nesters. So yeah. all our kids have grown up and flown the coop and uh, are establishing themselves elsewhere. So, yeah, it's been good. Three years. Uh, first year, we said we're not going to do anything here in the church, but get to know the congregation. Second year, COVID happened. Oh, man. <laughs> and... Uh, and so we uh, were learning things on the fly, and uh, yeah, it's been good. God has been uh, just wonderful, and uh, we've been enjoyed our time here so far and uh, continue to look forward to many more years of uh, productive ministry for the kingdom. So, You mentioned um, Baldwin, your church before Racine. Pastor, yeah. Pastor Drew spent, from Oosburg spent some time there. His dad was in Baldwin before you? Right. Pastor Dave was there for 11 years. Uh, my, my whole goal in ministry uh, uh, was to just stay there longer than he did. Because, uh, and we did it by one year or so. Very good. Once, 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 it, once we passed that milestone, we were like, uh, we're good here. So, yeah. You also mentioned... Uh, there, uh, so some of the families there have just vivid memories of uh, Drew when he was a... Uh, uh, child in it yeah i mean he basically grew up in that area also well i'd like you to may meet also them. yeah you might be interested to I know am. that uh, pastor tim Owinga, who was you know way back maybe that was before your time but when i came into the classes tim Owinga was uh, a pastor here at racine at that time and uh, he was born in baldwin also oh so. wow Wow. Yeah. So, so they're they're raising up pastors there at Baldwin CSC. They're they're doing something there. Yeah. Something in the drinking water. You also yeah. mentioned John Bilesma and I spent the weekend with uh some students from Brookfield CRC and word on oh, the yeah. word on the street is that he's gonna be back in the pulpit there for the Thanksgiving service. Oh so that'll that'll be really special. He's timeless. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, cool. Wow. Well, our, our, our normal format here is uh, that after an introduction, I would ask you what you're working on this week. How is uh, sermon prep coming along for you, Anson? It's, uh, I've had a couple extra weeks to uh, marinate in uh, the passage that we're uh, looking at. And we're, we're sort of in a transition between um, what's coming up in January and the Advent season. We always sort of like to, to do something as, with a specific uh, focus around Advent time, follow the church calendar. Um, that has been my practice for years, and it works well. So 
I, I wanted to do something uh, Thanksgiving me and um, and uh, that that comes from a place not of need, but I uh, thought we would focus on Thanksgiving. So we're looking at the Second Corinthians eight and nine passages. I was going to do a, a passage of three, but uh, circumstances dictated last week that I could not fill the pulpit. Sure. So uh, it's going to be a two part series on Thanksgiving, and uh, we're talking about our generous God, and uh, just. You know, this week, just looking at the Macedonian church and uh, what, what really motivated a, a a group of people who were, you know, uh, like we would say, like Haiti poor, you know, just mm -hmm. a, a destitute economy, um, you know, spiritual poverty, physical poverty, economic, emotional. And uh, that was sort of, maybe it's an oversimplification of uh, the Macedonian church, but, but Paul just brings up a need uh, that the church in Jerusalem just needs some help. There, there's a famine that was going on in that area, and he says, we need some help here. And the um, the Corinthian church said, yeah, let's do it. You know, they got all on board with that idea, and, and it feels like maybe after, a, you know, something must have happened in their situation that uh, maybe... Paul thought the funds weren't going to go through, but here's the Macedonian churches, and I'm always blown away with uh, with people who are touched by the gospel in a genuine way, where they said not only, well, we would like to help, they they were they were more. They said, please, 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 give us the privilege of coming alongside and giving gifts. And, and, you know, in, in my years, I always think, like, what motivates people like that? Yeah. You know, I, I, I can think of a handful of people that I just think are just overboard generous, you know, when, when, when there's a pastor appreciation day or something and they come with a gift, you're like, oh, my goodness, you know, you, you should, you know, you know, $2 would have been great, <laughs> but you came up with this amount, um, and, and it's above and beyond, and, and they're not, you know, they're not borrowing on their credit card to make this happen. They're just generous people, and, and they show that with gifts, you know, and, and the way they're always uh, full of gratefulness. And, and I always think, like, wow, uh, they really get what it means to serve a generous God. So that's sort of what we're working on this week. So we're just going to sort of walk through a little bit the Macedonian, uh, just line by line, just, uh, you know, how they wanted to give, how they gave, not only gave, but gave above and beyond their ability. They gave as much as they were able to, and they pleaded. And, and we find out that uh, it's because they, they, they knew Jesus Christ, and they knew the generosity of God, and it really clicked for them. So it's an inspiration and a challenge, yeah. you know, even for me. So I, I flipped to it quickly because I wasn't familiar off the top of my head with what was in Second Corinthians 8 and 9. And it's really a striking testimony. I mean, 8 verse 2, Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Yeah. And, and then you said they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service. Uh, that as a backdrop for uh, chapter 9, verse 6, uh, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Uh, that that 9, verse 6 is often abused by you know the health and yeah. wealth. Uh, oh, health, yeah. The health and yeah. wealth sides. But when you frame it the way it's meant to be read in context there, it's not talking about people becoming richer and richer. It's about people in extreme poverty still being generous. Yeah. And that's, that's, that is, I mean, like you said, it's hard to explain people who behave that way. Like what, what you, makes you generous? Yeah, you can only point your finger to it and say, they've locked into something that my heart longs for, you know, oh, as man. a... Uh, as, as a follower of Jesus Christ, that's, that's really what I want my life to be like. And, um, it, and, and it's not, yeah, like you said, that, that name it, claim it, uh, health and wealth kind of aspect to it, you know, like, well, 
if I give more look, uh, suddenly checks will be coming in the mail. That That's not the purpose at all, because for all intents and purpose, they continue to be poor. But, I, but I've heard people comment from time to time that have gone on mission trips to like countries like Haiti. And, and one of the things from our, our Western capitalistic framework, uh, they say, those people have nothing, but they're happy. They're happier than we are. And yeah. you think, you know, you just kind of hold up the two with all the wealth that we have today. And, you know, we're, we're talking about economy this week and stuff and how much we have. And we're going to make sure those shelves are stocked full of. And and we miss the joy of, of just, you know, um, placing all of our hope in Jesus Christ and not on the stuff of this world. You That's know? Right. And it's inspiring and challenging. Yeah, certainly challenging. Yeah. Well, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing, and and we'll pray for your sermon prep as you continue. Um, any any other prayer requests from you or from Racine that that we can keep in prayer? Yeah, well, just generally, uh, we're we're at an exciting point in, in time, as all churches are. You know, you're always like, oh, this is a key moment in yeah, our life. Yeah, you know? right. But uh, I think just looking ahead, we're we're trying to to think. You know. Recently, our leadership went through a, uh, a a booklet called Canoe in the Mountains. Maybe you're familiar sure. with yeah. that. Yeah. And what keeps coming up is that we're in uncharted territory. You know, the the church that we are a part of now um, is not the same as, as what we grew up with. And, but how do we continue the mission as Lewis and Clark did in, in uh, that's the main reference right. to it. You know, they, they were, they were, their mission was to find the passageway uh, to the, to the West coast, you know, so that um, as they controlled the waterways, they would have all the, um, you know, the access to the industry and the trades that uh, were needed at that time. And it's sort of like the internet is for our day now, you know, it was, just something that if you can log into it, it can be a useful tool and then we'll grow from it. And um, they came up to the mountains and now suddenly, you know, we're canoeing people. We know how to navigate streams and, and, and do things. But now here are mountains. How do we continue the mission, but in, in this strange new territory? And I, I think for us, this is all a matter of prayer requests, so it's kind of background for it. So for us, uh, having to go through COVID was a, a practical application of that. You know, when suddenly you can't do church the way we usually have done it now and, and have meetings and, you know, early on, we had seven or eight weeks where we just weren't gathering and we were doing pre-recorded services and having people come in that uh, were willing to lead some songs and uh, how do we do it? And so we've seen the benefit of that, uh, but also the challenges. So as a prayer, some of the benefits are maybe we're going to continue to live stream our services. But we're also noticing that there's a lot of people that uh, that have now developed about a year of not regular church attendance. So they may have been coming out of custom or habit, but how do we reach out to them and uh, and to you know continue to challenge all of us to to gather when we can and to to be a part of the body of Christ. So peculiar challenge. So our council is uh, wrestling through uh, some of those issues, seeking clarity, seeking vision. And uh, it's an exciting time, but also a daunting time. So pray with us as we navigate our way in these uh, uncharted mountains that we're in. Well, we'll, we'll so. certainly be praying for you. And for Racine, and um, I'm always reminded to, I should say at the end of these, thanks to Tim Coyman for encouraging us to be praying for one another because he's really yeah. championed that work. So I should mention that every time because that's really great and helpful. Um, but I appreciate your time, Anson, and, and hope we didn't yeah. uh, set you too far back this week. Nope. 
Good. It's a it's a pleasure. And are you going to be at the uh, winter retreat at all? Or we haven't gone the last couple of years. Um, we only ever all took right. a real small Hang group. Hang your head in shame, first I know, of all. I know. I'll, Fire I'll sneak out. With, uh, we're, we're, we're firing up our young people. I, I think we're going to send a delegation there. And um, I just, just Monday night, they said, Anson, you're hanging out with the youth. You need to go. So I, I keep hanging out with the young people, uh, thinking that it'll make my hair grow sometime. That's right, yeah. But, uh, it keeps you energized. Yeah. Or it drains your energy. Yeah. One of the two. In both. Yeah. Both. I'm, I'm not Somehow. As, as resilient as I used to be. But at the same time, um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, like all the, you know, what's our culture coming to? What are the young people like? But I'm still inspired by them and see that God's doing the work in them. And uh, we'll try to walk with them as they uh, navigate their way through life and, and hopefully be able to point them in a good direction. So hope to see uh, a delegation from uh, all over the classes there at yeah. the winter retreat. It's going to be a, a Quantico this time because it didn't work out with Fort Wilderness. So. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. Nah, I'll be praying for that too. I'm sure it will be yeah. a success. That's great. Well, thanks, Anson. Yeah. All right, Zach. Have a good one. Say yeah. hi to uh, Pastor Drew. I will. I'll go knock on his door as soon as we're done.